Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have Professor Francis Smith with us this evening, the first in a series of talks on the cranial connection. Professor Smith is clinical professor of radiology at the University of Aberdeen and professor of health and sports science at the Robert Gordon University. He also consults for MedSerena Upright MRI Center in London. He has huge experience of MR imaging of the spine and specializes in the application of upright MRI in patients following whiplash injury of the cervical spine and those with lower back pain. He actually pioneered the clinical application of magnetic resonance imaging back in 1980 and started the world's first clinical trial of MRI back then. He also pioneered the use of single photon emission tomography, that's SPECT, for the measurement of regional cerebral blood flow. He's a tremendous specialist in the craniocervical junction and its connection to a multitude of chronic conditions. And I'll leave Professor Francis uh, Smith to introduce anything else about himself that he'd like to. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. We'll be talking for about 45 minutes, or he will, and then um, he'll be available to answer questions. So please put them at the bottom of the screen. You'll see there's a Q&A button and a chat button. So just put your questions in there and um, we'll be answering them at the end. So over to you, Professor Smith. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I want to start off by uh, saying that this is always the amazed me that we persist in scanning people lying down when we look at the images in the upright position. Um, so when it, I was able to get an upright MRI scanner um, back in, in the year 2000 uh, with money from a Scottish Higher Education uh, funding council uh, grant, um, it gave us the opportunity to begin to understand the appearances of the spine under load. We bought the prototype the scanner, which uh, was able to image people lying down. So you, you get a picture like this and you can see normal vertebral bodies, um, normal intervertebral discs, little bulge in the back of that one, and a small prolapse at the lowest level. We also scan them standing, and this is the same patient standing, and you see how the lordosis, the normal curve in the lower spine increases, and the degree of bulge of the intervertebral discs increases. In the seated position, the effect of the muscles on the spine alters and you, you lose your normal lordosis. And in fact, when seated, the degree of prolapse is less than when you're standing. So here we are beginning to see the effects of gravity on the spine. We take this one and on the right, on the left hand side, we have a young lady who has a sciatica. She's lying on her back. Gravity is working this way. These are normal discs. And this disc shows a bulge posteriorly, which is entrapping one of her nerves. But when she's seated and gravity is working this way, and we can see the gravity is working this way because the soft tissues of her abdomen all bulge forward, you can see the degree of prolapse has increased and the height of the disc has decreased. So with this damaged disc, you can see there's a very definite difference in appearance. In the neck, the same applies, but this time let's consider soft tissues. And here we have patient lying down, gravity is working this way. And 
you can see the uh, jugular vein is uh, quite distended. Whereas when standing and, and, uh, and, and, and in fact bending backwards here, you can see how the jugular vein is collapsed because of the effect of gravity increasing the rate of, of, uh, of drainage to the heart. Let's take this as, a, as an interesting case, a 50 year old lady who had been suffering from neck pain for many years. She's had a normal lying down MRI which showed C5-6 disc degeneration. And despite re repeated attempts with conservative treatment, she hadn't got better. She was suffering transient paresthesia, um, loss of muscle tone in her legs and drop attacks. Here we can see the lying down MRI, where here are the vertebral bodies. Here are the discs of normal height. Under the 5-6 level, a small posterior bulge, which almost certainly could not be causing the symptoms I've just described. In the upright position, and what we hadn't noticed or what hadn't been noticed in the recumbent position is that the cerebellum, the tonsils of the cerebellum are coming through the, the foramen magnum and they are far more markedly through with the effects of gravity. It's to me very straightforward that if you have soft tissues under the effect of gravity, the images must be different and they must also represent the situation that patients find themselves in during their waking hours. Let me just go through a little study that was carried out. It was a multi central study with multiple different specialists. Um, half was done on the other side of the Atlantic, so it truly is a multi-centered study. And we looked at 1,200 consecutive neck pain patients that had presented to four different centers. Half the scans were required from an upright scanner and the other half from a normal conventional scanner. And half of each of those groups were either with patients with just neck pain, with no history of trauma, or those following a whiplash type injury. And we, the Images were read by two radiologists, I'll say one in North America, one in Europe. And we scored them as, whether, as being above or below the foramen magnum. And I'm pleased to say that we um, got enough data that we were able to do a good analysis. Uh, Five of them were considered to be of poor quality. So they were dropped from the series, um, which those five were in the recumbent trauma group. So of the remaining 1,195, we had a good agreement between the two radiologists. And what was interesting was that there were significant differences in the tonsillar station between recumbent and upright. The non-trauma group, people with painful necks, showed some tonsillar herniation in both the recumbent and the upright position, about 5%. In the trauma group, in the recumbent position, about nine and a half percent showed low lying tonsils. And we were surprised, even though we had suspected it might be the case, there was a significant increase in the upright position following whiplash type injury. Professor in other words, Smith, 
Um, yes. Could I just ask you to explain what's meant by tonsils here? Because the term Chiari and tonsils may not be entirely familiar to everybody listening. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I will. And, 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 and may I do that later on? Um, because it, 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 yes, it's, of course. it's a very important point. Of course. Um, so my interest was, was, was spiked by this study that we had done um, because I know of patients that suffer from the, the whiplash associated disorder um, and have symptoms which are similar to those of the craniocervical junction syndrome, i.e. neck pain, headache, shoulder pain, difficulty swallowing, blurred vision, ringing in the ears, nausea, fatigue, weakness, irritability, brain fog, dizziness, vertigo, you know them all. Why? Why have we never found a cause? In whiplash, and we won't dwell on whiplash tonight, it's not a straightforward whiplash that in fact, first of all, the, the jaw gets drawn in before being thrown back. And the, this fulcrum here is where the damage occurs. We, in conventional radiology, are not always very good at, at observing everything. And here's someone who um, had a whiplash injury and had a lateral x-ray film made at the time, which would be the correct thing to do. It showed a normal curve. It didn't show any significant abnormality at the odontoid peg, i.e. between the atlas and the axis. And then 15 years later, she comes back with neck pain. And you, you can see that the person writing this article has seen that there's been a change in the curve, that there's been disc disease, and there's been uh, osteophyte formation, all of which would have been precipitated and started off by the whiplash injury. What they do not point out is that there has been damage to the craniocervical junction. Junction between the skull and the atlas and axis. And that the axis here, um, the odontoid peg is irregular, osteoarthritic. But this is a problem that is persists throughout the world. That if any neurologist doctor requests an MRI examination of the cervical spine, they will get an examination which only includes the lower part of C2 down to T1. Multiple axial images are made at these levels and they forget that there is more to the cervical spine than C2, there is C1, which is at an angle there. So with this in mind, I looked at 40 patients who had previously been investigated following a hyperextension injury of the neck, who had had reportedly a normal MRI examination of the cervical spine. In other words, below C2 and they were a normal um, examination protocol in that it's, it's conventional to do T1 and T2 weighted sagittal images and axial T2 weighted images from C2 to T1. However, I believe that it is important to also look at this area. So with an upright scanner, and here is an upright scanner, um, with someone sitting in, in position, if he were having his head or neck examined, he would either wear a collar-like coil or have his head in a coil uh, to receive uh, the signals uh, and transmit them uh, to the computer. But to all intents and purposes, it's as open and friendly as that. 
we did the same as the conventional um, central T1 and T2 weighted images, axials from C2 to T1. But in addition, we did axial proton density images of the banto axial joint with the head looking forwards and also when turned to the right and the left. In addition to looking at the neck in neutral, we also looked at, um, at using T2 weighted images with the neck in flexion and extension. And we assessed it for all the things that need to be assessed, the alignment, the integrity of the discs, the integrity of the neck muscles, facet joint alignment, whether or not there was some instability of the spine. And then at the cranial cervical junction, we made the measurements of the triloaxial angle, grab oaks and Harris measurements, which I will talk about later. Looked at the alignment of the atlantoaxial joints and the atlanto-occipital joints, and where possible, the integrity of the ligaments of the cranial cervical junction ligamentous complex. And again, back to this interesting topic of the cerebellar tonsillectopia, which is the lowest lying part of the cerebellum, which sometimes goes through the foramen magnum. And in over 50% of the patients, 22, I got no additional information. But of the other 18 patients, 16 showed uh, atlantoaxial joint damage, of which 10, in fact, had dislocation. Um, two were certainly very unstable, and two had what is now called uh, cranial, uh, yes, C C cranial cervical junction uh, laxity or dislocation. And the cerebellar tonsillectopia was seen in 10 patients, which fits in with the findings of that multi-centered study that I discussed earlier. So I believe that when the cost implications of undiagnosis of mechanical damage at this level is very large, and this is not only a financial cost, but also a cost in, in the quality of life and the health of individuals who are suffering from uh, many of the symptoms of the cranial cervical junction ligamentous complex, it's important that this area should be examined routinely and more, more frequently. And this is me just beating the drum again. It's of paramount importance to show any dislocation or ligamentous damage when it's present, but equally to exclude such damage when it's not present. So if you don't look for it, you won't find it. And at the present time, the majority of radiology departments are not looking for it when they examine the cervical spine following um, whiplash type injury or when confronted with somebody who may suffer from one of the hypermobility spectrum disorders. So this has sparked my interest in looking at the appearances in not only whiplash injury, hypermobile patients, and more recently, um, it has been shown that people suffering from ME, there are some of them who have lax ligaments, um, one or two uh, with the chronic fatigue syndrome, who may or may not have been misdiagnosed, uh, fibromyalgia. We know that in Lyme disease, the Borrelia, uh, organism can affect uh, the ligaments and make them lax. And then there's this question of the Chiari syndrome, which is, is very different from all these other things in that it is a congenital, um, congenital abnormality and has a very different appearance from that seen in, in some of these other conditions. So the views we use to examine the spine with patients sitting normally, in flexion, in extension. And I like to look at the coronal plane because that tells me more about the, the alignment of the, the spinal column. We can measure the, the angle, the cervical spine angle, which is the line between the 
posterior part of, of C2 for the uh, axis and C7, and in this case it's virtually one or zero, very straight neck. On forward flexion, there is nine degrees of flexion, and here 40 degrees in extension. This is essentially a stiff, normal individual. We measure the cardioaxial angle, is the angle between the, that the skull makes with the top of the cervical spine. And in normal individuals, it, it, it ranges between 150 and 180 degrees. If it is less, then the odontoid peg pushes backwards and pushes into the brainstem. And here we have the cerebellum and the cerebellar tonsils, and they become squashed. So a reduced um, hypoaxial angle is a sign that there has been some basal invagination, as we call it, that basically the brain is invaginating into the foramen magnum. And grab the measurement is, is, is a measurement between the a line dropped from the clivus to the base of C2 and the arch of C1. But it should be less than nine millimeters as in this case. And then there are two other ones that if you run a line straight up here, up the back of the odontoid peg and upwards, the gap between that and the base of the skull, the clivus, must be less than 12. Um, and similarly, the gap between the top of the odontoid peg and the clivus should also be less than 12. So nice normal here, except that there is an element of basal invagination, as you can see, but it's not as, as, as it's not as severe as it could be. Now this is this is a, a, a very nice sketch showing the uh, C2 with the odontoid peg, C1, and the base of the skull, and this complex of ligaments that hold it together. Uh, I call it the, and others call it as well, the uh, the cranial cervical junction ligamentous complex. The largest of the ligaments is the cruciform ligament across there, and then the alar ligaments that come in like that. Unfortunately, radiologically and with NMR, MRI, I cannot see the except small accessory ligaments. But if the odontoid peg is moved to one side or the other, then it's likely that these ligaments are damaged. Can so as well as looking at it in the sagittal plane, it's important to be able to look at these in the axial plane and look for the, align the alignment one over the other. So here we have a series of axial images through the cranial cervical junction of a normal individual. Here's the arch of the atlas, the two, uh, lamina of the atlas, and then the axis, they're nicely aligned, and in the middle, the odontoid peg, which is not moved more to one side or the other. And at the back, you can see a black line, which is the transverse band of the cruciform ligament. We look at it in the coronal plane, like the diagram I showed you. Here's the odontoid peg in the midline, and here are the alar ligaments. Here's the joint between the atlas and the axis, the so-called AI joint. And here's one where we have a torn, poorly visualized alar ligament. The odontoid peg moved to the right um, by two millimeters, but that is sufficient uh, to indicate that the alar ligaments are damaged. So here we again, some normal alar ligaments. 
normal transverse uh, band of the cruciform ligament. Super normal and torn. Dontoid peg moved to the right. And in the coronal plane, the same thing you can see. It's slightly moved to the right. That, that uh, part of the cruciform ligament has been damaged. Sorry, that's just the other ligaments I'm looking at there. Sorry. So you can cut down the base of the skull, the nose, the sinuses, the brain stem, the cerebellum, coming down the condyles between the skull and C1, the atlas coming down into the atlas C1, nicely aligned, don't let peg in the midline, and the C2 axis all nicely normally aligned. Someone who has a dislocation, and this chap, chap dislocated his neck playing rugby. Nice alignment of the atlas. The axis is actually in the midline. You don't need to be a radiologist to see that the atlas and axis are dislocated there. If you don't look for it, you don't see it. And that's why I think it's important that if you have had an accident which has involved your neck, that the, that, uh, the cranial cervical junction is studied. Um, in this case, we've made the measurement as 20 degrees rotated. And this can be treated either by uh, specialized chiropractic or sometimes if it's acute by surgery. Furthermore, it's important to see if the range of movement when looking to the right and to the left is within the normal range. The upper limits of normal is taken to be 35 degrees uh, based on a paper by um, Henderson and his son Henderson, um, where they've studied this in great detail. They're neurosurgeons who work in, in Maryland and, and, and do a great deal of work with patients with hypermobility. So I take 35 degrees as being normal. And here we can see the, the angle between, yes, between the axis and the atlas is about 28 degrees here, and is a little more 38 degrees here. And what I want to see is in the intervening uh, images that I only see one bone. So here I see the axis, but I have a little bit of this, the atlas hanging down there. See it again here. You've got the arch of the atlas, and we can still see a bit of axis underneath, which indicates that there has been some separation due to laxity of the ligaments or damage to the ligaments. So when one looks at patients suffering with the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or the hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we looked at 49. Um, slightly younger than our control group, for whom we had 58, um, to look and see if uh, those measurements that I've just discussed, the cervical spine angle, the fibroaxial angle, the grab hooks and Harris measurements were different between the two groups. And if you look at the cervical spine angle, and you've seen these pictures before, you see that the neutral, the mean of that group was 17 degrees. In flexion, it was 11.5 degrees the other way. 
and an expansion about 32 degrees. Whereas in the Ehlers Danlos syndrome, there was an increase in the ability to flex the neck. And what I have found most interestingly is that the ability of the, these hypermobile patients to extend the neck is very great. So if we look at the case here of someone who is hypermobile, from what you've seen tonight and learned, you look at the, the angle here, which is normal, very poor ability to flex, uh, but this wonderful ability to extend the neck to up to 70 degrees. I take 55 degrees as being the absolute upper, upper limits for normal. Um, and here is another one, straight spine, and this ability to flex the neck way beyond the 18 to 20 degrees of normality. Due to the laxity of the ligaments here, and the, what I've noted that the intervertebral discs, the top four levels are different from the normal discs in patients who suffer from one of the connective tissue disorders. Same here, if you come and look, normal discs, and then these have lost the signal from the nucleus, allowing them to be squeezed by the excessive amount of laxity of the ligaments, allowing for a large range of movement. It's interesting that the triboaxial angle is also slightly reduced in EDS, but not significantly so. So uh, here's someone with basal invagination. We've seen a similar case before, um, just 118 degrees, which is very sharp. But as a result, the odontoid peg pushes back and squeezes the medulla of the brainstem. And in this case, the tonsils are low and sitting in the foramen magnum. So these areas are being squeezed and cause the symptoms that we know about. It's very often that there is not a laxity and that this doesn't increase or decrease significantly in flexion. But if there is some laxity of the ligaments, then there is an increase of greater than 20 degrees into extension, as is the case here. There is 22 degrees more than normal movement which raises the suspicion that of laxity of the ligaments at the cranial cervical junction. And here's another one. Um, and to talk about the ligamentous laxity, these you can again see in, in this case, the black discs, whereas these are normal discs. This angle is normal, but, but these appearances are abnormal and, and consistent with um, damage to the discs. And if you're only 20 years old and it looks like that, and there is this ability to flex to this degree, indicates laxity of the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments of the cervical spine. The grabs of measurement that everyone loves is just an aid in this whole process. And here is somebody with a larger than normal. If you remember, nine millimeters is what we allow. This is 12. But you, more importantly, you can see how the odontoid peg pushes into the cervical, uh, into the uh, brainstem and medulla. And in this case, low-lying cerebellar tonsils, but they don't go through the foramen but they may obstruct it. And similarly with uh, Harris measurements, these are very large, 12 is the upper limits of normal, 19 and 19. And I can see the dura there, but I don't see the apical ligament. So it has presumably been stretched and damaged. Now, cerebellar tonsillectopia. The cerebellar tonsils in the normal individual lie above the foramen magnum. Um, in the 
the Chiari malformation, a congenital condition where there are large cerebellar tonsils that are pointed in appearance and posterior, that is to the back of the brainstem and extend through it by more than five millimeters is considered to be the Chiari syndrome and very often is associated with a fluid within the center of the lower part of the brainstem and the upper cervical cord, so-called thorax. These are kind of cute little uh, cerebellar tonsils that I, I don't fall into any pattern that I recognize, but I put them in there just to remind me that this is what we're about to talk about. You can measure, you can see how here, and it was, it was called Chiari Zero um, six or seven years ago, um, which in fact is an erroneous name because it is not the Chiari syndrome. This is tonsils that have descended and you see them coming through into the foramen here because patient has been in a whiplash injury and the small dentate ligaments that hold the, uh, the lower brainstem and upper cervical cord in the middle of the canal have been damaged and the tonsils sink. They are rounded and they are more lateral than those seen in the so-called Chiari syndrome. So here we have someone with the other Stanmer syndrome. There's the brain stamp. There are the tonsils. They are out to the side. They are not in the, in the back in the midline. So when you look in the midline, they're just sitting, appear to be just sitting in the entrance to the foramen magnum. But when you look at them in the coronal plane, you can see how uh, on this side, uh, in this case, the right one is much lower than the left. And if you measure that, it would be six or seven millimeters below the foramen. Now here is somebody who suffers with the Chiari syndrome. They have a narrow triaxial angle. They have compression of the brainstem and they have these pointed tonsils going through the foramen magnum. They fill up the entire posterior back part of the foramen magnum big, pointy, hanging down. This is the Chiari syndrome. And the treatment for that is very often to make the hole bigger, the foramen bigger, to relieve the pressure on the brainstem and the cerebellar tonsils. Whereas in the Erlos Danlos syndrome, you can see there rounded, they are out to the side. This is Chiari, this is normal. One of the problems is that, that uh, there was a period a few years ago when surgeons would try and make the hole bigger for patients with the Chiari syndrome and many of the patients became ill because of the weight of the brain pushing down and pushing the cerebellum further into the foramen magnum. So that's why it's important to make the distinction in appearance between the Chiari syndrome and the Erlos Danlos syndrome, or this appearance is which is seen in, in, in a number of patients with ME and certainly has been seen in Lyme disease. It doesn't matter where the cerebellar tonsils are, if they are lower than normal, if they are wedged in the entrance to the foramen magnum, they don't have to be all the way in to cause an obstruction. But if this bottle were turned up, no fluid would come out. So it's, a, it's important to see the degree of how much of this hole is filled. Black is fluid, so this is a good half obstructed, not completely obstructed. 
whereas in Earl of Stanmore's, they are seldom obstructed, even though the, the cork is halfway into the bottle. When we looked at the atlantoaxial joint, and I, I've been rambling on and in and out of the study we were doing, that uh, of those patients, um, the 49 patients we looked at with EDS, that 26% had a stable joint. 50% um, there was obvious laxity of the ligaments in that the degree of rotation was greater than 35 degrees. And in 23%, 11 of them, there was evidence to suggest uh, dislocation of one or other of the facets of the atlantoaxial joint leading to atlantoaxial instability. And we seem to have come abruptly to an end, but that's probably a good thing. Um, well, th thank you very, very much, Professor Smith. That was absolutely fascinating. Can I just um, throw in one question of my own there? You made a clear distinction between EDS and Chiari syndrome, which you explained there at the end. Can one have both? I suppose that it would be possible. Um, the Chiari syndrome, the true Chiari syndrome, is a, is a mesenchymal disease. It's a, it's a disease, disease of the mesenchyme. Um, and and is, is, um, you're born with it. Um, some schools of thought believe that, that maybe there has been some dietary uh, indiscretion on the, on the mother's behalf in her pregnancy. Um, some believe it may be genetic. Um, okay, well, thank you very, very much. We received some questions in advance, so I'll just go through those quickly before the very many questions that we've received during today's talk. So one of them was, um, do you see misaligned atlas or what you called um, lax um, ligaments in that craniocervical area? Do you see that commonly in chronic conditions? Yes. Yes is the short, short answer. That, as I said earlier, that unless, you, unless you go looking for the problem, you're not going to find it. And what we have, have beginning to see is that, that a lot of patients who have been diagnosed with one of the hypermobile syndromes have a, an increased ability to flex and extend the neck and also to rotate the atlas over the axis. Um, and the whole problem has, it, it then becomes complicated by the fact that um, some there are a few surgeons in the world who are interested in trying to correct this surgically, who then require, in planning their surgery, to have the atlanto, um, the trilaxial angle, and the grabs of measurements made, and they are they are of, of very little value in what I do. Um, unfortunately, many patients like to have a number. Um, but in fact, you can you you can see as I showed in the pictures that, that they are very different, and you only require the, the measurement if you're going to be operated on, and that I believe should be it as a last resort. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I I, I see patients who, who come to see me who, um, yeah, I, I've seen a number of patients in the last. 18 months suffering from ME, who I have shown to have very lax ligaments. And in concert with um, Dr. Bo Bertelson at the Karolinska Institute, we've been looking at a group of patients with ME. And we find that um, almost 35% of the patients with a diagnosis of ME have lax ligaments. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that is a part of the ME syndrome or whether it is a misdiagnosis, I don't know. Because many of the symptoms 
but both conditions are the same. Um, so this, this is a, a nice conundrum to continue to try and unravel to, to help as many people as we can. And speaking with the doctors in London who work with EDS, uh, they, they tell me that they have seen a number of patients with ME and, and they, they say 45% of the ones they have seen um, are, are hypermobile. Now, they may be pre-selected by the general practitioners or referrals because they're clinically hypermobile and, and, and diagnosed with ME. But there clearly is a group of patients with ME who, are, who have lax ligaments and hypermobile. Thank you. Um, one question here. Once an upright MRI scan is done, who can we take it to? My diagnosis is AAI with lax or torn ligaments as per report, but my doctor doesn't know who to send me to. Um, I'm therefore stuck, possibly like many others. This is a very good question. Um, and, and one that, that, that humbles me because uh, it worries me that, that I can show very definite abnormality, um, which when pointed out to my peers, they accept, um, but the treatment of which is very difficult. Um, if the ligaments are lax because of the Ehlers Danlos syndrome, then the, any operation is of greater risk because the tissues heal differently and slower. And I know a lot of patients with EDS who have had the operation have taken a long time to recover. Uh, so there is a reluctance by neurosurgeons, quite likely, to rush into surgery when they know that they're going to make the patients probably unwell for a long time. Um, I know that many chiropractors do not fully understand the craniosacral cervical junction, but there are some who do. And I believe you're going to have a talk next week from my namesake, Ian Smith, who is a chiropractor who specializes in the atlantoaxial joint. Um, and in my opinion, is, is uh, highly knowledgeable in this area and, and, and doesn't treat anybody he doesn't think he's able to help. So maybe the, the questioner should ask you for his name um, and, and, and she should go and see him because he will assess her and he will give her an honest opinion as to whether one, he can help her or two, if there's anybody else who may be able to. Thank uh, you. And I'm taking this opportunity to put on record that I don't recommend surgery until it's a last resort. Understand. Yeah. No, it, 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 we do have him next week. Um, I'll be announcing that one at the end of um, this. It's actually on the 27th. So that will be really helpful. Thank you. Um, one more here. Can CCI AAI, that's um, the craniocervical um, instability or atlantoaxial instability that you've been talking about, cause the ears to bleed? And can it also cause loss of vision that changes from day to day? Thank you. Um, the diagnosis of, of, of instability at these two levels is a very difficult thing to do and, and should be clinically based with imaging as an adjunct to support the clinical suspicion. Um, to answer this specific question, I'm not aware of anybody who has bled from the ears as a result of damage to the two joints that we're talking about. Having said that, I know that if you have been in a severe whiplash injury and have damaged the base of the skull, then you will bleed from your ears. But in general terms, if you are unstable at the CCI and the AAI, then it's not a likely cause for bleeding from the ears. It may cause some visual disturbance. Um, 
but that is not common. Thank you. Um, one of the um, practitioners here has a teenage patient with suspected autoimmune encephalitis. She would like him to have an MRI, but he's very uncooperative. He spits and he bites um, when he's having blood tests. Would you suggest an open upright MRI or what would be the best option? In, in, in my what, 40 years of experience with MRI and, and uh, I also trained at the Children's Hospital in Toronto, um, unless the child is able to stay absolutely still, it doesn't matter what scanner you use, the images will be blurred because they will move. So what we have done in hospital is to Children are sedated because if you're going to, and it started when we were using x ray CT, if you're going to use x rays to examine the child, you want to get the best result. Five minutes of being unconscious is not going to harm them. So I think that, that, that if this young man requires a scan of some sort, then it has to be done um, in a hospital under good supervision sedated so they get the best result. Thank you. Um, where should we take upright imaging for a proper diagnosis? Which specialist? Uh, we've talked about management previously and you've mentioned um, one name and said one has to be very careful there. I mean, obviously you're a huge specialist, but uh, how would you address that question? Is, is this quite common what you're doing or is it actually very uncommon in, 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 in the UK and in Europe? It's uncommon in the world. I can tell you where it it happens. It happens. It happens in London. It happens in Manchester. It happens in uh, one or two centres in Germany. Um, it happens in New York. It happens in Maryland. It happens in Florida. That men and women who understand and who want to learn more about the cranial cervical junction and the neck and the effect of gravity on the spine. Um, do upright scanning. Upright scanners cost two million to install. Mm. This is why there are not a, a lot of them. Uh, there are some cheap ones, but they can't do the flexion and extension that is necessary to make a thorough examination. So I find myself in this awful position of having shown that there is a way of showing what is wrong um, in an expensive way. Um, but not knowing who is best to deal with the problem. Mm. And if, it, if it's uh, chiropractic, then it, it's someone who does understand and specialize in the cranial cervical junction. Any neurosurgeon of, of uh, ability can fuse that part of the spine to the skull. They do it on a regular basis in the acute situation, but it's not a procedure that should be undertaken lightly. And therefore there are very few surgeons who are doing it. Um, so I, I think that the, the answer to the question is that if the instability is so bad that the physiotherapy to strengthen the muscles has not worked, then maybe the opinion of a chiropractor would be good. And then if you really incapacitated the opinion of a neurosurgeon who will give you an honest appraisal is, is the way to go. Thank you. Um, are people with Lyme disease more likely to suffer from um, both this condition and also slipped discs in general? Yes, I, for some yes, for some reason the Borrelia family of, of, of organisms seem to like to damage our ligaments and and discs and and yes, um, so it, it is one of the known complications of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just I'm continuing to scroll through the questions. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to read a lot of them beforehand. Following a discectomy L4 L5, the disc became infected. Um, I've sub subsequently had a chronic Lyme disease diagnosis. Could the Lyme disease have caused the infection following the discectomy? The 
I can't answer that. Um, it's um, unfortunately infection is one of the possible complications of a discectomy. One of the things that the surgeon would have explained to the patient prior to the operation is one of the possibilities. It's mm -hmm. unusual, but it occurs. Um, it, it could have been the Lyme disease, I suppose, if, if, if the organism was still active. Um, mm. But you, without knowing all the details, and it's not possible to answer history. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just read the latter part of a, a, a longer question here, which is why is it not recognized in the UK that CCI and AAI can cause so many problems? And um, this is somebody who's had an upright MRI with Medserena, but is finding that neurosurgeons just don't see the issue and don't consider it has any consequence on their health. Is, is this something that's not recognized worldwide? Is, is it a, a problem in many countries? I know you've already just mentioned um, Copenhagen, where there seem to, seems to be a center of expertise too. It's willful ignorance. It's willful ignorance. That we are not taught at, at medical school about this condition. Um, in my 50 years ago, when I was a medical student, there was one page in my pediatric textbook of showing bendy kids with loose skin mm -hmm. who had the Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's not something that is, is widely taught at the present time. Okay. We, we there... have a number of people who are trying very hard to educate and, and, and to, to spread the word that there is something there that needs to be looked at. Um, and it, it's, um, it can be shown in the upright position. It can also be shown if you put if people put their minds to it uh, in, in the lying down position in either a CT scanner um, or an MRI scanner probably best in a CT scan. Uh, you can show the degree of, 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 of hypermobility of the spine and the, and, and the, and the craniosurvival junction. I would argue that it makes more sense to do it upright with the effects of gravity um, and also in the position where we get most of our symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I do not know who can help many of our patients who are watching tonight. Yes, well, we will be having another two um, webinars in this series, so hopefully a lot of those questions will be addressed. Yes, um, but they're, they're treatment people rather than diagnosticians. No, I do understand that. Thank you. Um, can a patient with similar uh, present with similar neural symptoms in Chiari and EDS? Yes. Yes. Um, the symptoms are very often the same. Um, there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, and I went through some of them in, in the talk. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go on the web and, and, and look for symptoms of the craniosurvival junction syndrome, the list of conditions that comes up is the same for EDS, for Chiari, um, for post whiplash. Mm -hmm. So any damage at the Craniosurvival junction, which impinges on the brainstem, the, the cerebellum, the autonomic nervous system, and the other nerves and vessels around that area, because it's a very busy part of the body, mm -hmm. um, will give a whole myriad of symptoms, which are the same. And you is, can, is, you know, is it possible to say what the long term symptoms could be of a 20 year old with EDS? significant laxity of small ligaments of the craniocervical junction? Or is that just too broad? Does it depend on a multitude of things? It's very broad. It's very broad. I've seen young men uh, 20 with significant symptoms and, uh, and with that degree of laxity. And then I can show you an, an old man of 78 who only discovered that he the penny didn't drop until he was 70 that he suffered from Ehlers Danlos syndrome. I used to be able to scratch my ear with my big toe <clears throat> as a child. That I have 
other connective tissue problems, a hernia, um, valve problem, I can contort myself still. My cerebellar tonsils lie low. Unfortunately, I haven't got those symptoms. I have some of the other symptoms of, of, of the Ehlers Danlos syndrome, those of, of the real connective tissue. So it, it's a very broad spectrum of disease. And it's a matter of finding somebody who understands it. And there are, there are specialists in, in this country who do understand the Ehlers Danlos syndrome, who are working with the Ehlers Danlos Society to try and push the boundaries and increase our knowledge. And, and these are the people that, that you should go and consult. We must connect with them, yes. Um, yes. Could effective treatment of Lyme disease, for example, improve the laxity of the ligaments? I don't know. I'm okay. not an expert in Lyme. No, I, no. That's I, something maybe we'll, we'll, we'll address next yes, week. Quite I, a lot I, of these questions are about therapy. Yes, this it, one... It, 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 I would hope that if you... I would hope that if you had... Um, had your Lyme disease treated early, and I, my understanding is that the earlier you, you find out that you have Lyme disease and you have the appropriate antibiotic treatment, the more likely you are to make a full recovery. Okay, thank you. Um, there are chiropractic and osteopathic treatment procedures to reduce space occupying compression in the foramen magnum. Have you been able to monitor any progress from interventions treated in such a way? No, but I would love to. Um, and I believe that the School of Osteopathy in Bournemouth has, a, has an upright, an open, upright open scanner. Um, and I would hope that they were doing that. Well, maybe we could put you in touch with the doctor who um, posed that question just to see if there are any options for that. Yes. We, we've got a huge number of questions still that um, I haven't been able to ask. Can I, can I ask just a couple more? Just a couple, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, can a patient have cerebellar ectopia, ectopia, hindbrain herniation from Lyme alone, or would they also need to have EDS if this was present? And how would you differentiate an EDS patient from an ME patient and Lyme on imaging? Is that even possible? Yeah, I, the short answer is it's not possible. Um, one, I don't think that in Lyme disease it's well recognized that there is any cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. I think that the, I know that the difference between Chiari and the Ehlers Danlos syndrome is, 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 is more complex, that often the size of the posterior fossa that contains the cerebellum is smaller in those patients with the Chiari syndrome. Uh, congenitally so, uh, than in those with the Ehlers Danlos hypermobility syndrome. Um, but as far as Lyme disease is concerned, I'm not sure that it's well documented that, that they suffer from hindbrain herniation. Did I miss the last part of the question? No, no, that was it actually. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, that's been absolutely tremendous. Very, very. Um, enlightening for us all, I'm sure, whether we've got background in that field or whether we're coming to it um, for the first time. Some people here are asking whether they'll have access to the information. We will definitely be putting up the recording. The recordings always go up under events and then past webinars. And um, we'll be asking Professor Smith afterwards whether he'll permit us to also put the slides up in PDF form Oh no, I'd like you to do that. I'd like yes, you to would do that. Be right. I don't Thank mean, you. It, 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 I've been in this this area for, for the last eight years and, and it's become my second passion to, to, oh, to okay. try and try and help people that, that suffer with symptoms of the craniosophical junction syndrome, either due to whiplash, to Chiari or to uh, hypermobility, ME or whatever, and to try and understand it better. And, and to communicate it as, as clearly and concisely as is possible to try and, to, and, yes, to educate those of us who, yeah, we were not taught in medical school about this. Mm -hmm. 
you're sort of taking on a mentor function really which is yes. which is amazing so we may well we'll collect together all the questions because i think there are about another 60 that haven't been answered so we'll like collect to them together them, yes. thank you so, some of them we can um address next week and um some of them uh we may request you to come back again if that's all right um, i'd love I, to thank you if, that's if i can be of help but... Well, I mean, one question that has come up here again and again, so I hope it's permissible for me to say it because you've been very restrained about it, is where can we have these, this kind of imaging done? Um, Professor Francis Smith does consult for uh, Medserena clinics, which um, I think you mentioned Manchester as well as London. And yeah, Med um, Medserena have two scanners in this country um, that, that, that do follow the protocol. Um, the protocol that, that, that I follow, which is the protocol that was set up by both Dr. Henderson in, in the United States, in mm -hmm. Maryland, mm -hmm. and Scott Rosa, who's a chiropractor in New York, um, and working jointly with Fonard, the manufacturer, mm -hmm. we have developed the, this protocol for examining patients, just first of all, with hip flash injury, and more recently with the other symptoms of the for the phase of Igor Junction. And, and, and you mentioned to me that it is still open. Um, these clinics are still open during the lockdown. So they are. There are ways are. and means of getting yes, this because, kind of diagnosis. Because lockdown doesn't send away the other diseases. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, um, I'll just mention that next week on the um, 27th of January, that's Wednesday, the same time, Dr. Ian Smith will be talking about hypermobility, CCI, AAI, craniocervical junction misalignment, and the importance of diagnosis, as well as staging in managing these syndromes. So he's a colleague who um, Professor Smith works with very closely. And um, two weeks after that, on the 10th of February, Dr. Peter Bishop um, will be talking about fixing the bite, the importance of occlusal disorders. So uh, that's going to be a fascinating series there. Thank you so, so much again, Professor Smith. I don't oh, well, want thank to you take for up inviting too much me. more of your time. No, thank you for inviting me. And I say, if I can be of further assistance, please don't hesitate. Very kind. To give me thank, time. thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody who's attended. Okay. And um, Bye. look forward to seeing you again. Bye bye. Thank you.